Thank you. What a nice feel. Uh, I want to thank Avra and John and the translators and all of the rest of the trainers and QMs for making some time for me today. I promised you a talk about impressions, but before I go into that, I'd like to give you a short graduation talk to the new avatars that are here. How many new avatars are here? Good. There's an old public relations slogan that proclaims thousands decide what the millions will do. You're the thousands. You will change the world, but you won't do it through any campaign of terror or political action committee or leveraged accumulation of wealth. You will do it with your care and compassion. You set a motto for future generations. Always train your mind to follow your heart. Differences in viewpoint should trigger curiosity, not hostility. And remember that everyone has an effect on everything, no matter how small. So improving yourself, helping others, smiling, will improve the whole world. And it requires inner strength, but kindness and instruction are the best strategies for changing the world. Now, if you were one step away from tipping the balance toward an enlightened planetary civilization, would you take the step? Yeah. And the next question is, how do you know that you're not one step away? <laughs> and if the next step doesn't get you there, how about the step after that? I mean, sooner or later, we are going to arrive and Today, we're one step closer because of the work that you've done this week. So, thank you. In the coming days, I wish you confidence, optimism, love, and peace. Live boldly, do the right things. And I don't expect you to create good lives. I expect you to create great lives. <laughs> Thousands decide what the millions will do. Hurrah! So let's talk about impressions. <laughs> An impression is a mark that is left by something pressing into something else. And when two things bump into each other, one or both of them tend to have an impression of that contact. And the contact can be very light, uh, a smile. I'll always remember her smile. It left a beautiful impression in my memory. Or, on the other extreme, an impression can be catastrophic, you know? 
a meteorite colliding with a planet. Kaboom! That impression we call a crater. And between these extremes, there are thousands of varieties of impressions. The stamp on your passport is an impression. Um, the machine that stamps a coin leaves an impression. The bug that hits your windshield leaves an impression. <laughs> and things interact in many different ways, and impressions are the result. And the impression marks can be subtle, they can be barely noticeable, or they can be powerful and completely change the character of one or both of the parties. Think of the impression that a brick makes on a window. The shattered glass on the floor is the impression left by the brick. And the longer you study existence, the more you're going to notice that a lot of things are pressing, bumping, colliding with each other and leaving impressions. And the impressions that are left coax us to tell stories to explain them. An impression is actually the beginning of a story. Impressions lead to expression, sort of an inhale, exhale sort of thing. And explaining our impressions is probably the motivation behind the development of language. Here's an impression that was found on the Navajo Indian Reservation in Tuba City, Arizona. It's a good impression, but it doesn't inspire much of a story. It's the footprint of a pteropod, which is a three-toed family of meat-eating dinosaurs. And the impression is approximately 65 million years old, and guessing by this pteropod's shoe size, he was about 10 feet tall. So we have a character for a story, but there's really no plot action. I mean, what did the pteropod do? And, well, what can a pteropod standing on one leg do? You know? <laughs> it's not the kind of impression that generates attention-fixing questions. And without the fixed attention, there's little motivation to create a story. Now, here's another picture. Here's some impressions that generate more questions and fix attention sufficiently that they generate stories. These are from the Paluxy River in Texas. And the gentleman that described them described a set of tracks just to the right of center, the ones that go straight down the riverbed, as man tracks. And the three other sets of tracks were made by pteropods. Now these impressions are unusual enough that they're, they're interesting. And you have to tell yourself a pretty good story to explain their existence. And now depending upon whose story you hear, the tracks either show three hungry pteropods chasing a man, or a hungry man chasing three pteropods. <laughs> I don't know how they got that they were hungry. My guess is that they were just throwing in an instinctive behavior to round out the story. Uh, makes you wonder what kind of stories they would have told if they had thrown in the mating instinct. <laughs> anyway, these impressions generated a heated controversy that went on for years. Was the man chasing the dinosaurs, or were the dinosaurs chasing the man? The man in pursuit of dinosaurs crowd believed that because the man tracks ran straight down the riverbed and the pteropod tracks uh, run toward the edges of the riverbed, that the man was chasing the dinosaurs, uh, kind of like a fox running through a flock of chickens and they scatter. On the other side of the controversy, the dinosaur in pursuit crowd believed that the straight man tracks show that the man was running for his life, and the reason the pteropod tracks 
go off to the sides is because the dinosaurs were flanking him for a kill. And down the middle was the only way he could go, sort of a dog's chase cat scenario. Anyway, the local Baptist minister who was a champion for the dinosaurs pursuing man story worked the story into his sermon. And you might say that he invested in the dinosaurs chase man story because it reminded the parishioners that life is vulnerable. And that increased the number of dollar bills in his collection plate. So he had an agenda for telling the story in his way. The tracks, he said, were left by Adam, driven from the Garden of Eden by giant reptiles because he didn't obey the word of God. I mean, some versions of a story give better returns in terms of attention or sympathy or dollar bills or even Academy Awards than other versions. Stories influence our behavior. And I don't know if anyone figured out how to profit from the other version of the Polexi story, but I suspect someone tried. After a few radio broadcasts, the preacher gained considerable public attention for his Dinosaurs Hunts Adam sermons. And this is when he came to the notice of a professor at the University of Texas. And the professor felt called upon to correct the story. And the professor explained that man appeared on Earth about two and a half million years ago, and the Paluxy River dinosaur tracks are 60 million years old. <laughs> well, that was that, you know. Right away, the minister knew he was facing a financial crisis. <laughs> Time is one of those pesky details that can transform your whole story. Uh, sometimes for the good, sometimes in the other direction. Now, if the preacher had been really clever, he could have introduced a time machine into his story or some marooned ancient astronaut. Or he could have even taken a clue from the town drive-in and brought in alien reptiles from another planet. You know, God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> but there's only so far that you can push the Holy Scriptures. And putting Adam in front of a running dinosaur was pretty much the limit. <laughs> A 57 and a half million year delay between a man running by and a dinosaur chasing him. It's hard to explain. <laughs> Not to say there wasn't a time I might have tackled it. <laughs> now remember, the inspirations for these stories are a few impressions in a layer of limestone, and the impressions are worn. I mean, they were underwater at the bottom of a river for 60 million years. That's 600,000 centuries. It's a long time, which tells us something important. Even 60 million year old washed out impressions can fix enough of people's attention to coax the more creative of us to make up a story. And the gamble is that we might hit the jackpot and recover some or all of the attention that the impression has trapped. And most of us are willing to give it a try. You know the saying, making a mountain out of a molehill? It means to make a big deal about something minor, make mountains out of molehills. Just for clarity, this is a molehill. And this is a mountain. <laughs> Some of you figured out where I'm going with this talk, and you're already ahead of me. <laughs> a gentleman colonel from Virginia once said, 
I prefer to lead from a distance in the rear. <laughs> so here's the point I'm making from some distance in the rear. Limestone is not the only thing that records impressions. Consciousness also records impressions. The events of life leave tracks in our consciousness, mental pteropod footprints that inspire us to tell ourselves stories to explain them. And there's not a lot we can do about the impressions that life leaves. I mean, things happen. Events, relationships, harsh words, they press into us and they leave their mark. And things fall on people. Cells go crazy, turn into cancer. Things blow up. Dogs bury bones in your flower bed. I mean, sometimes good things leave impressions on us as well, but they're not as likely to fix our attention. Kids are born, love blooms, sunshine picnics. But because we enjoy the good things so thoroughly while they're happening, not much attention is left behind. But the things we don't enjoy, the things we resist, they leave deep tracks, deep impressions in our consciousness. And those impressions fix attention, and the attention inspires future stories. And the interesting thing about this is that the, it's not the impressions that influence us long term or that shape our lives. It's the stories that the mental impressions motivate. The impressions are just there. Some marks from passing events, old scars. But the stories that we tell ourselves about the marks continue to influence us. And the stories can make us rich, make us poor, unhappy or happy, attractive or unattractive, make us feel powerful or make us feel weak. And the more we repeat the stories, the more influence for good or bad that they have on our lives. We don't suffer from past events. We suffer from the stories we tell ourselves about past events. Have you ever noticed that two people can experience the same impressions, like the Paluxy dinosaur tracks, and they tell themselves a completely different story? One person tells himself a sad story full of blame and injustice, and the other person tells himself a happy story full of adventure and discovery. And oftentimes they are talking about their memories of the same event. They just process the event differently. A few months ago, um, I had a friend, uh, a wizard, who died of cancer. And the cancer and its treatment had a fatal impact on her body. And now some people would have resisted the cancer and fixed a lot of attention on it. and They might have been motivated to tell themselves a victim story. Oh, undeserved suffering, abandoned by God, you know poisoned by the world. And it, it's just the nature of a victim story to cause more anxiety, suffering, and unhappiness for both the person who tells it and the person who hears it. I'm proud to tell you that my friend integrated the experience of the cancer and never told herself or anyone else a victim story. I mean, this is wizardry. She turned lead into gold. She honored her own experience. She owned it. And in the final week, she wrote me a letter and she said, this is one of the best things that ever happened to me. Wow. The cancer was destroying her body, but her story was about gaining courage, having time to reflect, 
and learning to welcome death as an adventure. I mean, the choice of story is something that we each have, but what strength it took for her to choose that story. I felt sad because she had to leave, but in another way, I had to thank her for such a beautiful lesson about choosing our stories. She traveled her path swiftly, honestly, and valiantly. She lived and died boldly. And she left a lovely impression. So the success or failure of your life is all about the story you choose to tell. And what you experience is the story you tell yourself especially when you tell yourself from the viewpoint of source. And then the story makes all the difference. And this is a bonus perk for doing Avatar because you get to deliberately shape the story you tell yourself. None of us can go back and change anything that happened in the past. But we can change the story we tell ourselves about it. We can take the resistance off. We can accept our own human weakness. We can forgive the human weakness of others. And we can relabel the event as a lesson. And the power to change the story is the power to change your life. Thank you. I'm not done, though. A group of frogs <laughs> were hopping through the woods, going about their froggy business, when two of them fell into a deep pit. And all the other frogs gathered around the pit to see what could be done to help their companions. Well, there wasn't anything to be done. When they saw how deep the pit was, the group agreed that rescue was hopeless. They told the two frogs in the pit that they should prepare themselves for their fate because honestly, they were already as good as dead. Sorry, mates, you're goners. Die well. (laughs) There's no way out. Of course, the two frogs in the pit began to jump with all their might, and the other frogs continued to shout, oh, save your energy and give up. You're as good as dead already. Accept your fate. Don't fight it. Rest in peace. (laughs) Finally, one of the frogs in the pit takes heed of what his fellow frogs are shouting, And he lets out a deep groan, and he tips over and dies on the spot. The other frog in the pit continues to jump with every ounce of energy he has, and though he's exhausted and he wants to quit, he just keeps jumping. And his companions up top, they continue yelling, accept your fate, just relax. But the weary frog, he jumps harder and harder, zigzagging off the walls of the pit. And wonder of wonder, he finally flops out of the pit. And the other frogs gather around him in amazement. Why did you continue jumping when we told you it was impossible? (laughs) The frog pointed to his ear and said, I don't hear, I am a deaf frog. I saw you shouting encouragement, and I told myself I didn't want to disappoint you. (laughs) 
Other people may try to influence the story you tell yourself, but you don't have to listen. And you don't have to tell yourself the story that others suggest or the story that they try to force on you. I mean, it is your story, if you know what I mean. And sometimes the only thing that you can do to save yourself is to be a death frog. <laughs> Have you got time for one more story? Yeah. Oh. Once upon a time, an orphan lion cub named Kashi was adopted by a flock of sheep. And on snowy nights, the lion cub found comfort in huddling, cuddling, and snuggling with the sheep. And he loved to huddle snuggle and cuddle in their soft wool. And to everyone it was plain that he was different, but sheep liked to huddle, cuddle, and snuggle too. And his fur was soft. And Kashi learned to talk like the sheep and eat mountain grass. And he would run and jump with the other lambs and they would finally fall in a heap on the ground where they would huddle, snuggle, and cuddle. And he learned all the rules to being a, a sheep. There were a lot of rules. <laughs> when to play, when to sleep, whom to follow, how to stand. And the lion cub learned them all. And in his mind, he told himself, I am a good sheep, stories. And the seasons passed, and he continued to grow. And that became a problem. He grew so large that the other sheep began to avoid cuddling, snuggling, and huddling with him. And cuddling, hugging, and snuggling were the things that Kashi liked best. And more than once he approached his sheep peers only to have them go silent and then one by one draw away. Lonely nights left an impression even deeper than the cold and the dark. And he began to tell himself, there must be something wrong with me, stories. And as the last snow of his third winter began to melt, his heart ached. And he left the sheep friends and he wandered into the night alone. And he slept alone, no one to huddle, cuddle, and snuggle with. And when nights are, are long and cold, we need to comfort each other, but Kashi had no one. Have you ever heard a lonely lion cry? So what happens now? Well, one day a wizard returning from Orlando <laughs> happened upon the sad lion. And Kashi's eyes were red and swollen and his whiskers were droopy and caked with mud. Lion, what's wrong? asked the wizard. <laughs> Just everything. Bah, says the wizard. That's a funny thing for a lion to say. Lion, says Kashi. That's a funny thing for a wizard to say. <laughs> So the wizard opened his pack and handed Kashi his source list. <laughs> Start at the top, the wizard instructed. 
Kashi reads, I am Lion King of Beasts. Do you have any doubts, asked the wizard. Bah, bah, bah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, says the wizard, say it like you mean it. <laughs> I am lion, king of beasts. I am lion, king of beasts. I am lion, king of beasts. And Kashi's eyes brighten and he starts to understand. He shakes the mud off his whiskers. So that's what it was. I always wondered, said Kashi. I'm a lion, I'm not a sheep. You are a fine lion, says the wizard. And Kashi's head drooped down. His lion smile disappeared. I suppose now I will have to live alone like other lions. I'm sure going to miss the huddling, cuddling, and snuggling. Hmm, maybe not, says the wizard, pulling out an avatar registration form. <laughs> One decides what the mini will do. That's Kashi on the far right. Thank you, I love you.